Welcome to the first lunchtime talk of fall semester 2017. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who will give you more information from the uh, Escala Educational Services that she represents. But um, I will tell you a little bit about Dr. Barry Hill. She has over 40 years of experience in teaching and learning from preschool to the college level. She is the former Dean of College of Education at Northern New Mexico College. She is the former Dean of College of Education. Prior to that, Dr. Berryhill was a master teacher with Los Alamos National Laboratories Math and Science Academy, where she was an instructional coach and created professional development programs for math and science teachers. A native of Northern New Mexico, Dr. Barry Hill specializes in cultural disconnects in Hispanic serving institutions. And I was very pleased and, and humbled to see that uh, Dr. Barry Hill and Dr. Melissa Salazar, who um, had something that came up that did not allow her to be here with us today, but this is a friendly place, a friendly audience for them because they did do some extensive work with uh, nine of our STEM faculty. So it was nice to see that connection made again. One more minor housekeeping thing, the pizza is on its way. I cannot believe after all of the arrangements that we made this week that, that it's on its way. But Dr. Barry Hill knows to pause so that you can all be fed. So with that, Dr. Barry Hill. Thank you, I'm glad to be here today. And don't worry, I know better than to stand between you guys and the pizza, so when it gets here, <laughs> you, can, you can have it. <laughs> Let me just tell you a little bit about Escala, and then we're, I want to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing, the data that we've been collecting, because I think you'll find it pretty interesting. So Escala, as far as we know, we are like the only ones in the nation who are focused on HSIs, who work with HSI faculty on a long-term basis, and who are working for, toward the goal of student retention and more effective learning in HSIs. There are four of us currently, uh, Dr. Melissa Salazar, myself, Dr. Andres Salazar and Dr. Christy Archuleta, and we've been fortunate to be joined by some of our former, our, our former participants who are now coaches, including Renee Beaton, and we're so happy to have her. So there's a lot of work to be done in this area. One of our, um, well, you'll hear a little bit more about us. Go ahead, I'm trying to figure out who's changing the thing. All right, so first of all, <coughs> We have a lot of experience, those of us that are working in Escala, we have been in education for a long time. Most of us, ha all of us have been working in HSI, uh, HSI, so we have a really great idea. What is it? Is it the little? Actually, that feels good. <laughs> Just somebody just go do it. <laughs> yeah, like that's like, we could do that too. <laughs> so uh, we have a lot of experience. I'll just, I, I won't work on this, but we've done a lot of research research uh, projects we have done we have been evaluators of title V and title three we've written grants everybody writes grants right but we've done a lot of grant writing we've done a lot of evaluation we've done a lot of thinking about what could make a difference in HSIs and we come from a very funny part of the world we come from northern New Mexico and in many ways it's just like southern Colorado right it's a very it's a very unique place and um, we are the we have the greatest income divide in the whole United States between where we are and where Los Alamos is we have three distinct cultures and there are more I mean we're not like Los Angeles public schools that has 220 languages but we but we do have Tewa Spanish and English and we have uh, three cultures that we have to work with 
all the time. So we are the only bilingual state in the nation. Did you know that? It's in our constitution. You can't change it. We have to teach in both Spanish and English. And we have some of the worst educational outcomes. Thank God for Mississippi. Isn't that awful? I was telling my husband that, and he says, don't say that. That's really terrible. Go ahead. And <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. sometimes we, we, we take turns. Sometimes we're at the bottom and Mississippi is just one over. Yes? I'm just curious when, the, when that was added to the Constitution about the bottom. At the beginning. We but became... No, you. Colorado's different, but in the New Mexico co state constitution, we are bilingual, and that's real. Oh, no, don't get me started on this. this. Is a part of the his, part of the Treaty of, of Guadalupe Hidalgo is the reason that we have that we are a bilingual state. So English only means absolutely nothing to us. We can't change it unless we do some constitutional changes to to our government. So. We partner with uh, Hispanic serving institutions in many ways, but the, the most important thing that we do is faculty professional development. And we talk about equity, we talk about instruction, and we talk about classroom evaluation. You know, we don't think very often, how do we evaluate what's going on in the classroom? So that's one of the things that we do. And we like to conduct all kinds of research on faculty attitudes and practices. We think that that's really important. And so we've been asking those questions since the beginning when we first got started. And we like to fiddle around and figure out some kind of instruments that will help us to assess student engagement. Isn't that hard to assess? That's very, very hard to assess. We used to do it just by observation. We'd look at the class, we'd count how many people were in there. So if you were the observer, then you'd watch to see what they were doing. But you can't read people's minds. So I mean, they could be at the mall or some other weird place. And they've got their student face on, and it looks like they're engaged. So we've been working on some instruments and looking at metrics that measure faculty growth. So faculty is oftentimes reluctant to participate in anything like this because they are afraid it's going to be evaluative and it could be in the wrong hands but we did we don't do any of that we don't do evaluation we just say what would you like to change in your classroom and how can that happen for you so i go ahead I'm trying to like as if it's going to remember just all by itself okay so the most important person for your students is your faculty those are the most important people. So if you don't think that faculty are important, we want you to just consider this. A hundred faculty in any semester will assign grades for probably 9,000 students. But this is the most important part. They'll have 20,000, over 20,000 student contact hours. Think about that. Talk to each other. What does that mean? So it, does anybody have anything that they'd like to say? So who should be getting paid the most? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Since I'm faculty, I can say that. <laughs> we know stu faculty is the most, they're the most important people on campus because you are always going to be judged by what? Your retention rate and whether people are continuing, whether they finish in some kind of a reasonable time. You are going to be judged by that everywhere, everywhere in the United States institutions of higher ed are being judged by their retention rates. So we, if we know that faculty are the most important factor in retention, then we have to consider how are we going to develop faculty. So in fact, I'm so sorry. <laughs> faculty matter more to minority students. Check this one out. There was a longitudinal study done and they were looking at a whole bunch of, they were look, it was kind of a meta-analysis and they were looking at minority student retention and this is Umbach and Warzynski. And, what the, and if you need this, you can have a copy of our, of our slideshow. So <clears throat> what they found are two things. Good teaching is a matter of equity. So minority students 
disproportionately benefit from excellent teachers. And isn't that an interesting idea? An excellent teacher is going to actually have more of an influence on minority students than even on just um, average students. For minority students, the other really important thing is that for minority students, connecting with a faculty member who is supportive of their achievement and believes they are intellectually capable uh, is one of the most accurate predictors of college success. How do we know this? There are other studies that have shown that the most important thing that you could do for your students is to have mentorships, internships, take them on trips, throw them out in the river and have them find whatever they find in the river and do this and do that. Every time that you do that with students, every time that you're interested in what they're doing, every time you have a chance to connect with them around your content and in a way that uh, affirms their capability of learning, you are, what you're doing is you're really impacting their willingness to learn and to become engaged. So. Rob does a bunch of those kinds of things, right? Rob, you take your students out and they do all kinds of things I remember from when we were here before. And those students probably, one offshoot of that is that you become more interested in whether they are continuing, right? So you have, you have a personal relationship with them and intellectual relationship, not the other kind. Okay, go ahead. All right, so are college classrooms equitable places of learning? You guys have had conversations about equity. Are they? <coughs> yes or no? Talk about it. Let me give you a minute to talk about it. Then, then when you click again, some words will come up. Okay. Okay, so let me ask you a question. I, I'd like to hear from like two of you what you think about uh, either the picture or the question, one or the other. Can I have a volunteer? I call you by name, but I don't know all your names. I do know some of your names. Somebody, quick, you're, you're, it's between you, it's between this and the pizza, yes. Oh, actually, this has nothing to, er, that challenge should be there. We're talking about complex and, and robust learning. The, 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 the picture just like says, picture makes it look like yeah, that. makes it look like that. But actually, we're n we never, ever say that what you need to do is to make it easier for students. No, we just no, say, no, we always want to give it that. Yeah. The box yeah. is the resource, right? I don't know, so does he, I don't, I don't know if he needs resources. Those things that th those things that they actually need to be able to get. Yeah. So it in in th that's. Okay, well, we're talking. Why are you sorry? Because then I probably misunderstood what the picture was. No, 
don't be sorry. That's what we're doing. We're talking. Good grief. <laughs> don't be sorry about that. We're just, it's just that we have been told before at a scala that what we're trying to say is that we need to make it easier. And that's not it at all. If you're, if you are training nurses or doctors, please be as hard as you can be on them because they're, you know, I'm, I'm older than you are, but I'll probably need their help one day. So, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to put up the words right here on this slide and then you can get your pizza and then we'll keep on going. Go ahead. All right. So uh, many minority students are capable, but they have a lot of non-cognitive issues that keep them from, from succeeding. And we know that by embedding some strategies into your classroom, you can really improve the outcome of those students. And that's one of the things that we do at Escala, and it's time to eat. Oh, I don't have it with me. Do, do I, I mean, uh, yeah, she can give it to you, uh, Marcella. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just write for the newspaper. So. Huh? I write for the newspaper, so I have to write. Oh, great. Okay. Right. Oh, I hope you don't feel like I was <laughs> jumping on you. I was just like, oh, you know, I we get that a lot that that you know that we're not doing enough for our kids who already have stuff, but they're going to do well. They are going to do well. And it's going to be... Well, they'll do well the, enough. They'll do well enough. Well, I but hope they could do better enough. if they have... Like, like he, could see, he could see more or whatever if he has yeah. the box, mm -hmm. right? And, but, but, but that picture makes it look like yeah. that you're advocating well, the it's a, of his box for somebody it's else. A it's metaphor. just a picture. Yeah, exactly. It's just a metaphor. Exactly. You know? exactly. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard a lot of things about this. This, this picture, this the picture. same picture. Yeah. So that's how I... But, but the picture does make it look like his box went there, right? Oh, so I think the equity box. Oh, so like we just box. had X amount of boxes, yeah, and so, yeah. so if, it, if, if, if he's going to get a box, then that means that I so got it. Is, that's why immediately we yeah. have resources. There's only, we, only have, we only have three boxes, and so, and so we're going to take one box. See, that, well, the that discussion, the the discussion but the it's discussion the between of so equality so versus equity is a so very interesting discussion. Yeah. It's it's become very do you know what I'm saying in the picture to make it show that there's not only three boxes? The reality picture shows that there's, a, there's an infinite number of boxes. Because the way I can see a picture, too, is that, that the boxes are maybe lowering the fence is the thing of making boxes easier. Oh, yeah, lowering the fence. Well, you guys really care about them. You got dominoes, not hot and ready. Go, <laughs> go, ahead and change, go ahead and change it. You can go get your pizza. Okay, so let's let's just keep going or I'll be I'll be left with a bunch of slides we didn't the most important part, right? The part you didn't do, right? <laughs> so, what we like to think that we're helping to teach faculty is that we need as a, as high institutions of higher education, we need to shift our mentality from weeding out students to cultivating them. And you know, I I was uh, struck my mother's 99, can you imagine? She'll be 100 in like two months, and she doesn't want a birthday party. Ha ha, we'll do one anyway. <laughs> so I asked her, I said, well, so what did you want to do when you finished high school? Because she was one of the few that actually finished high school. And she said, oh, I wanted to be a PE teacher. Can you imagine? And I said, well, why didn't you go to college to be a PE teacher? Uh, cracked me up to think of her coaching ba basketball, but 
She said, because they told me that I wasn't college material. And I don't know what they based that on, but she's always felt that way in her life, that she just wasn't college material. But what we're finding out now that we have a lot of Hispanics who are entering colleges and they're entering at a, at a faster rate even than white students. And so we have them. And so we need to shift the way that we're thinking about our students so that we're not just weeding them out, we're actually cultivating them because it's costing us a lot of money. We shouldn't have to be bringing in people to do technology from other countries. We should have those people here and we should we should invest in their education because there are a lot of people who want to do that kind of work. So we also know that minority and underrepresented students enter college from an inequitable K-12 education system. Do you know that? You do know that, right? You know that down deep in your heart that some of your students have never had, that some of your students coming in as freshmen have never had a science lab course, correct? Have never been taught APA style. That's just not what they did in their high school. So they're coming in and they're having to learn things from the very bottom. How do we, what do we do that? We have to just figure out those kinds of things. It would be an interesting thing for some faculty to make field trips into high schools that feed into Alamosa and find out what's happening in those high schools so that you're not totally surprised by what happens when students get here. So, and what can we do about that? Does that mean that they're just, that's it forever? Their fate is sealed? Well, no, of course not. That's why we're here, right? <laughs> so, minority student achievement can be dramatically improved by looking at those non-cognitives. What are we talking about when we're talking about non-cognitives? Just shout out. Hmm? Attitude, okay. What else? Non-cognitives. Perceptions. Perceptions. Ah, very good. Another one? Family obligations. Well, family obligations, that, yeah, okay. The role of family in, in your life, right. Mm -hmm. We hear a lot of talk now, they put that grit. Grit, okay, so grit has a lot to do with non cognitives but we're and we're talking also about things like time management study skills reading comprehension all those kinds of things that make good students good and poor students fall by the wayside so how can we address those in um, college we found that yes you can and it's not that difficult go ahead so we have been keeping uh, some demographics on our faculty as we've gone along. And so we've asked ourselves two questions. What are the demographics of instructors in Hispanic serving institutions? And what patterns can we see? And how does this impact how they, how they react and how they work with Latino and Latina students? And the second thing that we've been asking is how do we characterize student engagement? That's just a big deal anymore when you're thinking about student retention. So, and how can we give faculty some really good, actionable feedback? Go ahead. So we've got some, um, we've, we took, uh, from, the, from the time that we started, which was 2014 until now, we have taken, um, we have taken information based on surveys from 385 faculty, both adjunct and tenure. They, most of them are voluntarily attending our sessions a few have to it's mandatory but they but they still have uh information and we've worked with 17 hispanic serving institutions and six of them are four-year and five of them are two-year community colleges <coughs> so this is what we found out so we'll fly through these just keep yourself on your saddle okay here we go most of them, most of our faculty is, is female, 67% compared to 33%. Go ahead. The race and ethnicity of, uh, ethnicity of HSI faculty, according to our sample, 70% is white, 11% Latino, 8% is other. What the heck is that? <laughs> What, what is it? How significant is that? <laughs> no, no, wait, go back. And we have 3% black, 7% Asian, and 
one percent you know that's Pacific Islanders right okay so if you looked at this long enough and thought about it long enough you might reach a few conclusions but in the interest of time we'll keep going <coughs> something else that we asked our faculty is what is your parents highest education level this is out of 100, a sample of 146 people white faculty actually have it's pretty their, their, the, their parents mostly have bachelors right bachelors and beyond college educated parents Latino faculty have quite a few of them have parents who didn't even finish high school and those parents that are at the graduate level very very small amount right black faculty this is a black faculty that reported of course you see, you know that and so we see that the black faculty who reported and are actually serving they have parents who finished high school and a lot of them have parents who uh, uh, were educated at the graduate level asian faculty there's an, another interesting, but we have even less, well, actually we have more Asian than black faculty in our sample. Just think about that for a minute. Hmm. Go ahead. Here's another question that we asked them. How many years have you been teaching at this HSI, right? So out of our, out of our faculty, we find that 29% have less than six years on the job of college teaching. What do you, what do you think is the value of experience as a college professor? What's that, what, how, what's the value of that experience? It's actually, I think it's quite a bit. So, we're going to keep going. Just another one here. Then we ask this question, where did you learn to teach? Where did you learn to be a teacher? And we have 54% who said that all they did was what? Observe somebody else. The good and the bad. And um, I think that kind of like slides into the none category, right? <laughs> because it's actually, we have 18% who say they have had no teaching training at all. So you can be a PhD in uh, whatever, something, name something. <laughs> Nuclear physics, right? But that does not mean that you have any clue of how to teach. So um, we, we see that 12% say that they've learned through experience, but then we wonder, where did they learn and how much experience do they have, right? I mean, that's a question. Some of them have had, 9% have had formal teaching mentorship and family influences, you know, all those people that had graduate uh, people in their families, they probably grew up in university environments, right? And, fam um, and so it's, it's very interesting. We have a little 1% slice that is teaching themselves to teach through reading research, which is kind of like teaching yourself to cook from, learn, from a cookbook, right? Might work, might not. <laughs> Where do you learn to cook from somebody else, right? I think. So don't you find that interesting? That's very, very interesting. Okay, last one. <clears throat> so HSI faculty's teaching goals and students' learning goals. This was a great, this was a great uh, survey that we used to do with all of our faculty and then they took it off the, um, they took it off the internet. We haven't been able to find it again. But they, but it was really neat because it would, it would disaggregate your findings. So this is what we would ask. It's actually, what is, what are your teaching goals as an, as a, as a professor, right? And so you'll notice there's personal development, work and career preparation, and um, faculty is the blue, faculty is the blue, and uh, liberal arts and academic values, discipline specific value, uh, knowledge, 
basic academic success, and almost every single instructor that we've ever met says that they want to teach their students critical thinking skills, higher order critical thinking skills. Almost everybody, that's what the goal is. Then we asked them this other question. What would you say that your student's goal is in coming to school? And that's the orange. Do you see any disconnect in those two goals? Big, huge disconnect, isn't it? Not only that, but when we ask faculty, what does that mean to teach critical and higher order thinking skills, they oftentimes do not have a way to articulate that. So we have a huge disconnect in that faculty is thinking that they want to do things that they have in mind, this one thing that they want to do, and, and they know that their students have a totally different goal in coming to school. So you've had several of these little ideas, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you three minutes to come up with, and then we'll go random around, and I'd like at least three questions or ideas that you could ask yourselves about this kind of, of information. So talk to each other for three minutes. Remember we have, hey, so what brave souls do we have who want to tell us your, tell us a question or an idea that came up as you were looking at these again. Three ideas. Someone? Rob? Yes. Yes, go. Feel free to uh, illuminate us. <laughs> What's the difference between teaching goals and learning goals from the perspective of how they're done? Is it what we think they should be learning? What we think they should, be, what we think that we're teaching them yeah. and what they want to learn. Are they the same? I don't know. We th ask the question. I, I, I don't know. Is that a, that's a good question to ask. We were wondering, so this is faculty's perception of students. Right. Yeah, it's not the students. An interesting question would be to actually pull the students to find out where they're learning. It would be. I don't, I, I, you know, so I, I think that would be a really great thing to do, and that would be, that, but we need students in order to do that. But you guys have students, so you know, at some point you could, you could ask your students, you know, why are you here? What is your main thing? And give them some choices and see what they come up with. It would be a very interesting way of finding out what your students are thinking, right? The, um, but we do know that there's a disconnect somewhere, even in my perception of what I want to teach and my perception of what I think my students want to learn. There's a disconnect. There's something, something isn't jiving there. So it's worth exploring. Another idea. I only know a few of your names, so if I have to call you by name, you're going <laughs> to. Tawny. Uh, can we align our goals to our students' goals? If they're more focused on working career preparation, can that take a point? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. That's a good question. So do, uh, how do we do that? I can think of some ways that you could do that real fast is to increase mentorship opportunities. Go ahead. Could you do both and? I think you could. You'd have to be very, um, yeah, you'd have, to, you'd have to be very focused and intentional on it because there's X amount of weeks in a semester. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. And you're using this, you would be 
taking that higher order critical thinking skill and incorporating it into um, their work preparation, which is what we were talking about. Good. I might be wrong, but the way I think that chart to read is that you've got two areas of approach to the same subject. You have the students coming into the classroom and what they expect to gain from it, because society teaches us that mm -hmm. education is good money and a good job. And you've got the teachers that are here to actually help spread knowledge and critical thinking and, and abilities that they're wanting to convey to the students. So approaching from different angles, um, if you wanted to bring students' opinion up with the skills, the rewards versus benefits of actual critical thinking, which she was saying, and how it would apply to what society has taught them to be Well, you're absolutely right. I don't know how we marry the two things. You know, we have to keep on thinking how we marry the two things so that it becomes something that's really relevant. And I, I'm thinking that one of the ways somebody was saying, oh, yeah, about how, how does this apply to me working in the workforce? When will I ever use this, right? I ask myself that in algebra all the time. No, I'm just kidding. And it's like, oh, dear, when am I going to use this? And I'll forget the formula by the time I'm supposed to figure out where the trains are going to meet and crash. And oh. So... Uh, <coughs> Yeah, but there are ways to do that because every mental model, every way of thinking, every way of organizing, all of those things are really important in the workforce as well as learning to work with each other. Most people get fired not because they can't do the job, but because what? They can't get along with the people they're working with. So these are the three things. Go ahead. These are the three things that we've, um, go, go ahead to there, that we have come up with in this little sample. And the 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 data might be good, it might not be good, we could probably do it better, all that kind of stuff. So we know that Latino and Latina faculty's family background matches their first generation students' experiences more closely than white faculty. It's just a pattern that we see. Number two, the majority of HSI faculty have not had formal training in teaching and learning. And number three, Faculty teaching goals and students learning goals can be a major disconnect. So we have to be considering those kinds of things from, from our data, but you could keep data yourselves. Do you have a way of surveying your students? Do you, do you survey your students often? Can you survey your students in your classes? It's great ways to get information about your students. The more you know about your students, the more likely you are to be sympathetic to the fact that they, that they didn't have a, a science lab class in high school or whatever. So there are a lot of good things that you can gain from knowing more about your students. Go ahead. <laughs> there, and we look at faculty. We asked about faculty time use. So we did this survey, and this is what we found out. You guys are very busy. Most of you teach um, at least 12 hours a week, some of you more. A lot of time is spent in preparing slides. A lot of time is spent in scoring papers. A lot of time is not, not very much time is, is spent in giving students non-evaluative feedback. The feedback we usually give to students is in the form of a grade. And then that's it. It's like immutable, like one of the Ten Commandments. It can't be changed. And designing instructional activities is the least amount of time. People, uh, uh, faculty is just not given that time, is not supported in designing instructional activities. So they oftentimes, they just stick with what they've done before. And, um, and only change slides when the research shows that that's no longer true. <laughs> I, it's easy to just keep going using the same stuff over and over again. So we asked faculty to do several things, uh, several changes. One of the uh, changes is we asked faculty to stop doing all the work and to start designing instruction where the students do more work. Because we think that faculty should be free to look at their students, to talk to their students, to find out what their students are thinking, rather than to be just presenting material. 
We think it's more important for them to be actually listening to what students are understanding from the material. That way the, the, the instructor shouldn't be working so hard, but that's, it's a difficult thing to change. We're, we're, we're just kind of like inculcated in higher ed. We have a way of doing things. We have content that we have to cover. We, we're, we're, we're afraid to let students make mistakes in our content. So we, you know, we just tend to shy away from having them talk to each other. But talking to each other and learning together is one of the best ways to increase that, um, that kind of effectiveness in, in teaching. Go ahead. And um, you know, we have a little, <coughs> we have a little structure. We ask teachers, we ask our participants to uh, videotape themselves for 45 minutes and then to code their results. We don't watch the videotape ourselves. So it's just the instructor and a glass of wine. They go through and figure out what they did all during those 45 minutes. One of the most interesting things is that we, we have something called a student talk ratio. How long did you talk? How long did your students talk? Did your students talk at all? We have some instructors who come back and they say, I didn't realize that I talked for the entire time. Nobody else talked. Nobody else said anything. I talked and they left. So what we have found is that if we just if we just have people look at their own data, they make changes that are important to them. So it's not even that we have to, it's not even that we have to say, you have to do this so many minutes. They actually start saying, well, I could have my students talk even for one minute, that doesn't take very long. I could have them talk together for two minutes, that doesn't take very long, and then see what kind of a difference it makes. Next. Uh, so we also added some equity questions to, our, to our, our little structure. And so we asked them, how many questions did you ask? What kinds of questions did you ask? How many different students spoke in your classroom? How many minutes did those students speak versus how many minutes a professor spoke? And are those tasks timed? We have come to believe that timing a task is just, is absolutely important. So we're gonna show you a couple of these Go ahead. Uh, so this is somebody's. Um, see at the bottom it says how many non-rhetorical questions the instructor asked, zero. Uh, tally the number of different students who talked during class, four. And there were 90 students in this class. And so these four students actually spoke for eight minutes. Interesting. But it's, it's, it's all self-coded self and self-monitored. So you're just actually teaching yourself. We have another one to show you. Uh, at the top, you have high, medium, and low engagement. And what people find is that they teach themselves when their students are highly engaged and when they're engaged at a low level. And what does that mean? And what can I do more of to, to change that? OK. So the next instructional shift is that we would really like for faculty to be aware of the importance of emotional, of that emotional aspect of learning. We know that kind of intuitively that we need to be careful of our students' emotions and the kind of emotional environment we set up in class. But you know, in higher ed, we kind of think that all of a sudden people aren't emotional or if they are, they're just going crazy or something. I don't know what it is. We're afraid of emotions. So uh, we talk a lot about, in, in our institutes, we talk a lot about how do you set up a positive emotional environment for your students because we know, go ahead. We know that stress shrinks brain networks and then people can't learn. So um, I, if I, I have known faculty who are very sarcastic with their students and they set up a real negative emotional environment and it is just scary to be in that class. In fact, a lot of students just drop because they're afraid that the, that the faculty member will start doing what? Singling them out. So, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna just do that. So we need to be careful and we need to think about how we affect our students emotionally. Go ahead. Um, so one of the things that we've been asking people to do is to create a little bit of positive tension 
in their classrooms by asking students by name to answer questions and we have had really great response. People have really enjoyed that. Go ahead. Okay, and we have a lot of different things that you can do to foster that kind of emo positive emotional momentum in your classroom. In fact, I could, I, could, um, I could suggest that one of the best ways to do that is to come in and always say good morning, good afternoon, how are you today, talk about the Broncos or something that everybody, just a little bit, just a little bit as you, as you start stirring the soup for your class. And what do you know, you'll get more people a little bit uh, more comfortable. Go ahead. Okay, and the third one is that this ki the kind of, of research that we're asking participants to do is really important. And we have found that some institutions are using that, uh, that their, their action research project as uh, part of like the SOTL process, the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, and part of the tenure process. So we're asking uh, faculty to do little projects with their own students, and it's wonderful. As a matter of fact, go ahead. Uh, Matt Stephenson, he's not here anymore, right? Oh, yay, so we can use his stuff. <laughs> he did this really great little project on clickers when we were here, and uh, his question was, what happens to student exam scores when you repeat clicker questions to help students retain information? So he would do clicker questions, but then he said, once I ask those questions, I never ask them again. So what he did was he just came back to them over and over again and, and kept on doing that. What, what is he doing? He's just doing review all the time, constant review and constantly telling students, you don't have permission to forget. You don't so he set up this whole thing and look at how his scores improved. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? And we have lots of these now. We have a lot of, um, we have a lot of little research projects where people have, okay, where people have actually looked at their own, at their own practice and figured out what works better and, and uh, instituted that practice. So go ahead. <coughs> so Pedro Noguera says, you don't have to change the student population to get results, but you have to change the conditions under which they learn. So that's the, that's the challenge, is how do we get faculty to do that? And go ahead. And we found that, you know, the good news is that faculty are willing to do it, but they have to be supported. We have to pay them to come to institute. We have to pay them to do that kind of research and, that, and be those kinds of coaches because that's, I, we have to respect their time and their efforts, right? And we have a few people who told us that the thing that they really liked was that for the first time they talked to other people on campus. And at Escala, we really believe in setting a table. Do you know these royal banquets? They're so wonderful. They have little, they, they measure how far apart the plates are. They measure how high the flowers are. The chairs all have to match. Everybody, they know exactly who is going to be serving whom. And uh, it's just uh, like this amazing process. And at Escala, we really believe that what we want to do is to set the best table that we can. So we bring current research. We try to do the very best that we can during institutes to keep faculty engaged as well. And we know that the bad news is if, 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 if you don't keep on working at, the, at those changes, they're just going to fizzle out and they're going to die. So departments need to figure out how they can work better together to keep those changes going. And you know, you can find your own, you can find your own data. You know your own retention data. And we need to look at those things and be as holistic as we can about it. Go ahead. Thank you. I did it. <laughs> now we even have time for just a few questions. We are going to, we are, we've been holding summer institutes and are really happy to invite you. You can pick up a flyer on your way out. And uh, our summer institutes are four days long.